financial crisis. You make some very interesting comments. Now, while the financial media is talking about booming stock markets and accelerating GDP growth, you aren't quite as op optimistic. Uh, we both know that most of the growth we've seen in recent years has been built with huge amounts of central bank stimulus, and the fundamental problems that drove the last financial crisis have hardly been resolved. In fact, uh, you think the next financial catastrophe isn't too far away, and, and many among the elite are getting ready for it. If you can, briefly lay out uh, some of what you've been seeing. Sure, Mike. You, uh, you touched on two different threads. One is the sort of, let's call it the short to intermediate term, which is, you know, how's the economy doing? Uh, what would the forecast be for the year ahead? What do I think about stocks and so forth? That's one part of the analysis. But the other one is a little bigger and a little deeper, which is what about another major financial crisis, liquidity crisis, global financial panic, and what would the response function be to that? So let me, let me separate. They're related because uh, I mean, what the one point I always make is that there's a difference between a business cycle recession and a financial panic. There are two different things. They can go together, but they don't have to. For example, October 19, 1987, the stock market fell 22% in one day. In today's Dow terms, that would be the equivalent of 5,000 Dow points. So we're at, you know, 26,000 or whatever as we speak. 22% drop would take it down about 5,000 points. Now, you and I both know if the Dow Jones fell 500 points, that would be you know, all anybody would hear about or talk about. Well, imagine 5,000 points. Well, that actually happened uh, in, in percentage terms uh, in October 1987. So that's a financial panic. But there was no recession. The economy was fine. Uh, we pulled out of that in a couple of days. It actually, after the panic, it wasn't such a bad time to buy, and, and stocks rallied back. Then, for example, in 1990, you had a recession, a normal you know, business cycle recession. Unemployment went up, there were some defaults and all that, but there was no financial panic. In 2008, you had both. You had a recession that began in 2007 and lasted until 2009, and you had a financial panic that uh, reached a peak in September, October 2008 with Lehman and AIG. So they're separate things. They can run together. So let's kind of separate them, talk about the business cycle. I'm not as optimistic on the economy right now. I know there's a lot of hoopla. We just had the big Trump tax bill and the stock market's reaching all-time highs. I mean, I, I read the tape. I, I get all that. But um, there are a lot of uh, headwinds in this economy. There's good evidence that the Fed is over-tightening. Remember, the Fed is doing two things at once that they've never done before. They're raising rates. I mean, they've done that many times, but, but they're raising rates. But at the same time, they're reducing their balance sheet. This is the opposite of QE. I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with QE, quantitative easing, which is money printing. That's all it is. And they do it by buying bonds. And when they pay for the bonds from the dealers, they do it with money that comes out of thin air. That's how they expand the money supply. Well, they did that starting in uh, 2008 all the way through till uh, 2013. And then they, they tapered it off, and the taper was over by the end of uh, 2014. But they were still buying bonds. So that was six years of bond buying. They expanded their balance sheet from $800 billion to $4.4 trillion. Well, now they're putting that in reverse. They grabbed the gear, and they shifted it into reverse. And they're actually they're not dumping bonds. They're not, they're not going to sell a single bond. But what happens is when bonds mature, the Treasury just sends you the money. So if you bought a five-year bond five years ago and it matures today, the Treasury just sends you the money. Well, when you send money to the Fed, the money disappears. It doesn't, it's the opposite of money printing. So the Fed's actually destroying money, actually reducing the money supply. So they're raising rates and destroying money at the same time. It's, it's a double whammy of tightening, and I don't I believe the U.S. economy is nearly as strong as the Fed believes. They rely on what's called the Phillips curve, which says unemployment's low. Uh, that's a constraint, and uh, you know, wages are going to go up, and inflation's right around the corner, and that's part of the reason they're, they're tightening. But there are a lot of flaws in that theory. First of all, the basic Phillips curve theory is junk. It's just not true. We saw that in the late 70s when we had sky-high unemployment and sky-high inflation at the same time. And we've also seen it recently when we've had low unemployment and disinflation at the same time. So you can start by saying the Phillips curve is junk, but even if you thought there was something to it, there's so many problems with it in terms of labor force participation, demographics, debt deleveraging, technology, etc., that it just doesn't apply under the current circumstances. So the Fed's tightening for the wrong reason. They're tightening at the wrong time. And there's a lot of evidence that a lot of the Growth in the fourth quarter was uh, consumption-driven, but that was debt-driven. People charged up their credit cards. Consumer debt spiked. Uh, savings rate is uh, near a very long-term low. It doesn't look sustainable. So lots of reasons to think that the Fed's going to overdo it, 
get it wrong, tighten, throw the economy either into a recession or very low growth with disinflation. So I'm just not buying the inflation. Happy days are here again story. And there's also good reason to believe that the tax bill will not be as stimulated as people expect. That all that's really going on is the running up a deficit by another trillion dollars, and we're already way into the danger zone, and then that's actually a drag on growth. So good reason to think the economy is going to slow. That by itself would take the wind out of the stock market and cause a, a, a potentially very serious stock market correction, at least 10%, maybe as much as 20%. So we're talking about going down, as I say, five or 6,000 points on the Dow before the end of the year. So that's one scenario. The scenario I talk about in my book really involves a financial panic. Now, the thing there is that these are not that rare. We, well, we, I already mentioned the, uh, the one, uh, really, two-day panic in 1987. But 1994, you had the Mexico tequila crisis. Uh, in 1997, you had the Asian financial crisis. In 1998, you had the Russia long-term capital management crisis. In 2000, you had the dot-com meltdown. 2007, the mortgage meltdown. 2008, the financial panic. Uh, these things happen every, you know, five, six, seven years. Not like clockwork, but that's kind of a typical tempo for these kinds of meltdowns. And it's been nine years since the last one. So nobody should be surprised if it happens tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not predicting it will happen tomorrow. I'm just saying nobody should be, be surprised if it does, whether it's tomorrow or next month or next year or even a year and a half from now. Don't think for one minute that we're living in a world free of, of financial panics. And by the way, you, these two things could happen together. You could have a slowdown that leads to a financial crisis, a replay of 2008. But here's the difference, and this is really the, the, the point of your question, Mike. In 1998, we had a financial panic, and Wall Street got together and bailed out the hedge fund long-term capital management. In 2008, we had a financial panic, and the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. So each bailout gets bigger than the one before. In the next panic, whether it's this year or next year, who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, each panic's bigger than the one before. Each response is bigger than the one before, going down this uh, chronological sequence. The next one is going to be the biggest of all. It's going to be bigger than the central banks, and you're only going to have one place to turn. If you had to get global liquidity right now, the Fed said that 1.5% in terms of the target Fed's funds rate, so the most they could cut is 1.5% to back to zero. There's good evidence that to get the U.S. economy out of a recession, you have to cut interest rates 3 or 4%. Well, how can you cut them 3% when you're only at one, you know, one and a quarter, one and a half percent? Well, the answer is you can't. So then what do you do? Well, then you go to QE. But they already did that. They haven't unwound the QE. They started to, and that's what I mentioned, but they haven't unwound it. The balance sheet is still around $4 trillion. So what are you going to do? Go to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? I mean, some people would say, yeah, well, what's the problem? Those are the modern monetary uh, theorists, you know, uh, uh, Stephanie Kelton, Paul McCulley, Warren Mosler. There, there are a bunch of them who think that there's no limit in the amount of money the Fed can print, but there is a limit. It's not a legal limit. That legally, the Fed could do it. But there's a psychological limit. There's an invisible confidence boundary that you cross, and people just say, you know what, I'm out of here. Get me out of dollars. Get me into gold, silver, fine art, land, it, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, cryptocurrencies, if you like, whatever it might be. But get me into something other than dollars because I've lost confidence in the dollar. We've seen that before also. So putting that all together, in the next financial panic, and nobody should be surprised if it happens tomorrow. It's going to be bigger than the central banks. They're going to have to turn to the IMF for liquidity. Uh, the IMF has a printing press also. That's the International Monetary Fund. They can print this world money called the Special Drawing Right of the SDR. So, yeah, they can pull trillions of SDRs worth, you know, trillions of dollars. One SDR is worth about a dollar fifty. They could pull trillions of SDRs out of thin air and pass them around. But here's the point. I spoke to, to uh, Tim Geithner about this, former Secretary of the Treasury. It takes time. The last time they did this, by the way, it went completely unnoticed. You know, the panic was in 08, and in August, of, August and September of 2009, the IMF did issue SDRs to help with global liquidity. But that was a, almost a year after the panic. And the point is, it just the IMF is kind of slow and clunky. They're not, it's not the fire department. I mean, they might be like a construction crew that can come in and put it into a foundation, but they're not the fire department that can help you when the building's burning down. So what they're going to have to do is what I call ICE-9. They're going to have to freeze the system. 
first, starting with money market funds, then bank accounts, then stock exchanges. Uh, you know, they might reprogram the ATM to let you have you know, $300 a day for gas and groceries. They'll say, well, why do you need more than $300 a day? That You, know, get, you get some food and gas in your car. Why do you need more than that? Uh, we can't let you take all your money out of the bank. We can't let you take your money out of the money market funds. We can't let you sell your stocks. And I describe all this in the book in detail with a lot of end notes. You don't have to read the end notes unless you want to, but this is all documented. It's all publicly available. It's not some science fiction scenario. This plan is actually in place, and I describe how. So just to kind of wrap up, I expect a weaker economy than the mainstream in 2018, perhaps stock market correction based on that alone. I also expect another financial panic. It's impossible to say when, but eight years on, nine years on, I would say sooner than later, this response function is going to be something that people haven't seen since the 1930s. Now, let's talk specifically about gold, safe haven assets, including metals, are, are way out of vogue these days, at least among the mainstream public. Uh, now, most investors likely will be flat-footed and probably won't see the next financial crisis coming, just like the one in 2008, until it's too late. Uh, confidence in the U.S. dollar and the financial system is hard to shake uh, with or without plenty of good evidence that both are in trouble. Uh, we're even seeing some gold bugs beginning to lose faith. They know that there is plenty of risk out there that you just laid out, but they uh, are growing growing tired of watching just about everything outperform precious metals. Uh, what are you saying these days to people who might be thinking about selling gold and, say, joining the party in the stock markets? Well, let me spend some time on that, but, but just to say a kind word about the people you're describing. Look, gold just finished a four-year-plus bear market. It lasted from August 2011 to December 2015. In that bear market, gold went down about 45% peak to trough. And if you use the uh, about $240 price from 1999 and just scale that up to 1900 and then back down again to 1050 which is where it was in December 2015, that was a 50% retracement. And by the way, my friend uh, Jim Rogers, uh, you know, one of the greatest commodities traders in history, uh, co-founder of the Quantum Fund with George Soros, a legendary commodities trader, he said to me, but he, he has a lot of gold. He expects gold to go much higher, as do I. But he said, Jim, nothing goes from here to there, meaning you know, he's, he's reaching way up in the sky, up, up, into, uh, up into outer space. He said, nothing goes from here to there without a 50% retracement along the way. And I think that was very good advice. Well, okay, but we've had the 50% retracement. That's behind us. We are in a new bull market. Now, there was a bull market from August 1971 to January 1980, and gold went up over 2,000%. From January 1980 to August 1999, there was a very long 20-year grinded-down bear market, and gold went down about 70%. Then you had a new bull market that lasted from August 1999 to August 2011. And that 12-year bull market, gold went up over 700%. And then you had another bear market from August 2011 to December 2015. And as I say, gold went down 45%. We're in a new bull market. It started in December 2015. Now, here are the facts. Look, look gold goes up and down. Right? It's volatile and we know this manipulation, and people get discouraged, and they buy gold, and then some hedge fund or China comes along in the gold futures market and slams the price down, like, oh, gee, why did I buy it? And I get all that. I understand the discouragement. I understand how difficult it is to watch you know, stocks go up and Bitcoin go up, and I'm sitting here with gold, and it just seems to be going sideways, but it's not true. In 2016, gold went up over 8%. In 2017... Gold went up over 13%. So far in 2018, gold is up 3%. You take the entire period from the, the bottom of the last bear market, beginning of the bull market, December 2015, to today, gold is up over 25%. It's been one of the best performing asset classes uh, of all the major asset classes. It's not you know, crazy like Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's collapsing, which uh, I also uh, you know, predicted some time ago. So the truth of the matter is, these are the first, 2016, 2017 are the first back-to-back -back years of gold gaining since 2011, 2012. Although at that point it was already off the top. It's, it's more of a statistical anomaly that gold went up in the year 2011. Yeah, it did, but it, went, it was way down, way off the peak in September of that year. But now we have two back-to-back -back years of gold going up. 
very significantly. We're in year three. 2018 is year three of this bull market. It's off to a very nice start. The fundamentals are good. The technicals are good. The supply-demand situation is good. We haven't even gotten into other potential catalysts, including war with North Korea, loss of confidence in the dollar, financial panic, even a, a normal business cycle recession or if inflation gets out of control. There's just a whole list of things that are, are going to drive gold higher. And the last point I want to make, Mike, is that gold is doing this performance against headwinds. The Fed has been raising rates. When you raise nominal rates and you tighten real rates, that's normally a very difficult environment for gold. And yet gold's going up anyway. Can you imagine what's going to happen when the Fed has to back off? Because right now, as I said, they're over-tightening. Well, when this economy slows and that data starts rolling in later in the first quarter and early second quarter of 2018, the Fed's going to do what they, what they, what they call pause. Uh, it doesn't mean they're going to cut rates. That's, that's somewhere down the road. But but they pause, which means that it's, you know, right now they're, they're like clockwork. They're going to raise every March, June, September, December, 25 basis points each time. Boom, 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 like clockwork. But every now and then they, they, they don't. They skip. Uh, they pause. Well, if your expectations are going to raise and then they don't, they pause, that's a form of ease. It's ease relative to expectations. That's, going to, that's what's going to happen later this year. And all of a sudden, this headwind is going to turn into a tailwind, and gold's going to get an even bigger boost. So I see it uh, going to 1400 over the course of this year, perhaps higher. My long-term forecast for gold, of course, is $10,000 an ounce. But that's, and I'm not backing away from that. That's based on, that's just simple math. That's the implied non-deflationary price of gold. If you need to use gold to restore confidence in a, in a monetary system, in a financial panic or liquidity crisis where people have lost confidence. So that's not some made-up number. That number is actually fairly easy to calculate. But, you know, you don't go there overnight. You've got to get to 2000 and 5000 before you get to 10000 I think right now we're in a new bull market. It's going to run for years. We've got that momentum. We're off the bottom. But people are always most discouraged at the bottom, right? Well, that's the time you should buy. I mean, it's just human nature. I'm not following anyone. I'm not criticizing anyone. It's just human nature. It's like, oh, man, I'm so beaten down. I'm so sick of this. I'm so tired of this. Well, that's usually the time to buy, and guess what? It is. Uh, are you worried about this a potential government shutdown, or, or are you just saying, I'm going out to dinner tonight, not worried? As John Vernon said in Animal House, 0.0. 0. <laughs> uh, that's how much I care. Uh, it's happened before. Nothing's going to change. It's political positioning, and I gu guarantee you, uh, we'll wake up in the morning, either it's going to be sunny or rainy. Well, no protection uh, from the bears if the government shuts down because the National Park Service won't be there to help you. But uh, the bulls don't seem to care on Wall Street. What do you care about right now? People have said that because the Fed had kept rates so low, they push everybody into equities, which are risky. You must have some side window trade right now that's not specific to equities, right? Well, all I can tell you is commodities. I think it's going to be a commodities 2018 you have a weaker dollar, but economies around the globe are now accelerating. That is a great quinella to get things uh, moving. You can see copper, aluminum, palladium, steel, all that are rising in prices, and the stocks are going along with it. The worst thing I can say is right now they're a little extended, probably pull back, but I think it's going to be a big year for them uh, this year. Nickel, zinc, industrial metals give a sense of how well global economies are doing because they use a lot of that to build skyscrapers. Uh, Gary, we're at session highs right now as we close out the week. Um, where do you see the markets? Do we have another uh, big thousand point move? Uh, I, I think there's a chance when you can't pull the market back 1% after it's up a lot, it tells you that the uh, buyers are still around and sellers do not have the upper hand. And I, I think we go higher. Washington's bloated big engine that can T Y the shutdown threat matters. By David Stockman. January 2018. We have been here before in the blow-off stage of a stock market mania that is being driven by nothing more than momentum. Speculators and robo-machines alike are buying the market solely because it is going up, almost, every day. Their excuse is FOMO. But their downfall will be utter failure to have noticed headwinds gathering everywhere but most especially in the Imperial City. The fact is, the current continuing resolution, CR, Impasse underscores that Washington has been reduced to a state of operational dysfunction, policy fracture, and partisan paralysis like never before. The Pauls can only keep the lights on four weeks at a time or maybe even less as tonight's shutdown showdown will determine. To be sure, the talking heads of Bubble Vision bravely insist that this latest shutdown threat doesn't matter because when push comes to shove these CR and debt ceiling impasses always get resolved. 
enabling the market to live for another day. No sweat. Au contraire. Each time the fiscal can is kicked down the road by one of these pathetically short CRS, it is actually a measure of defeat because under today's macroeconomic and financial circumstances, time is the absolute enemy as the pressure in the cooker inexorably builds to the explosion point. Everything is out of sync and behind the curve on the monetary, fiscal, and macroeconomic fronts. The Fed has dithered for 100 months in failing to normalize interest rates and reduce its hideously bloated balance sheet. Belatedly, however, the knee-jerk Keynesians who inhabit the Ecclesiastes building have become positively desperate about reloading their dry powder to combat the next recession. So they have put shrinkage of their massive portfolio of government and GSE debt on automatic pilot. This means that for the first time in history the Fed will be dumping bonds on the market at a $600 billion annual rate come October. And there is every reason to believe that the ECB's bond buying days will hit the zero marker in October, as well, and that compares to a $90 billion purchase rate only a few quarters ago. Indeed, under its upcoming German leadership takeover, it is likely that the ECB will actually pivot in 2019 and embark on a bond dumping campaign. Two. So what has been a concerted central bank bond buying campaign at the $1.5-$2.0 trillion level per year is heading for the flat line. And eventually the entire $22 trillion convoy of central banks will pivot toward QT, shrinkage, when the madman Kuroda of the BOJ is finally nudged off the stage next spring when his term ends. To be sure. The impending era of relentlessly rising bond yields is not especially indicative of an outbreak of monetary policy enlightenment among the world's central bankers. Rather the lead dogs are the Fed and the PBOC and each has their own Keynesian status reasons for pivoting to QT. In the case of the Red Ponzi, it's the palpable fear of Beijing that its $40 trillion house of debt cards will come tumbling down unless it sharply curtails the explosive growth of credit especially in the shadow banking system and real estate sectors. But the point is, with the Fed and PBOC pulling in the reins, the balance of the world's central banks will have no choice but to follow their lead or experience devastating foreign exchange market dislocations. 12-08-16 underscore chart 09 it is only the suspension of disbelief on Wall Street owing to several decades of central bank coddling that fails to recognize the QT danger. Yet the three main central banks are sitting on elephantine balance sheets that account for 23%, 50%, and 95% of GDP in the US, Eurozone and Japan, respectively. These levels are so far off the charts of historical practice that they fairly shout out, the global bond market is a fake. It's actually the artificial product of trillions of phony central bank demand for debt securities that is now coming to an end, meaning that the $100 trillion global fixed income securities market is about to clear based on real money savings, not central bank fiat. This will soon become known as the great bond market reset, and that development will knock the stuffings out equity and risk asset markets, where aberrationally low yields and cap rates are still priced in. In this regard, a key milestone was punctured this morning when the 10-year Treasury yield hit 2.64% or exactly double the 1.32% bottom record in July 2016 after a 35-year downhill march from the 15.8% yield your editor once experienced up close and personal. Needless to say, neither Washington nor Wall Street are prepared for the great bond market rest and an era of relentlessly rising yields. In this context, in fact, the complacent theory of the talking heads is especially egregious. Not to worry, they aver, the Fed's withdrawal of extraordinary monetary stimulus is being well telegraphed and implemented slowly. Right. Somehow the implication is that if you know a freight train is barreling toward you, it's safe to remain sitting on the tracks. And that gets us to the current shutdown crisis. The kin will be kicked in due course, of course, whether it's before midnight Friday or late Sunday evening in order to assure an orderly opening to the markets in Asia. But the reason this is very bad news is exemplified by the manner in which the House GOP leadership passed the four-week extension with relative ease last night by a 230 to 197 margin. In a word, Speaker Ryan and his henchmen bought off the leaders, Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan, 
of the Freedom Caucus with promises to, well, spend a lot more money as soon as possible. That's right. The only remnant of political support for fiscal rectitude will get a vote within 10 days on raising the defense appropriations for FI 2018, the current year, by $80 billion, and also a standalone vote on an anti-immigration package to include the Donald's $30 billion Mexican wall boondoggle. Up until around 6 p.m. Thursday the House also did not have the votes needed to pass the CR, but reluctant Republicans got on board after House GOP leaders negotiated a deal with Freedom Caucus leaders Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan for upcoming votes on defense spending and immigration. President Donald Trump was also involved in the deal-making, Meadows said. What this means, of course, is there is no stopping what we have previously described as the mother of all bond market collisions. There is virtually no way that the FI 2019 borrowing requirement will come in much under $1.20 trillion given the $700 billion baseline deficit, $280 billion revenue loss from the tax bill and upwards of $200 billion of additional defense, disaster aid, Obamacare subsidies, and domestic appropriations that are now certain to happen. With the Freedom Caucus having vacated its prior posture of resistance to the fiscal tidal wave now cresting, the ongoing CR battles a few weeks at a time amount to a little more than a Washington kabuki dance, it's designed to shuffle through the legislative sausage grinder this massive spending outbreak a few pieces at a time. In short, the two financial arms of the Imperial City the Central Banking Branch and the U.S. Treasury are about to dump $1.8 trillion of debt on the global bond markets. And we are quite sure that the law of supply and demand has not been repealed. Nevertheless, Ignoring these inexorable developments entirely and marching happily to the tune of cans being kicked and bouncing down the road, the stock market keeps trucking steadily higher. And we do mean higher. At yesterday's peak moment, the Russell 2000 was valued at 139x earnings and the S&P 500 at 25.3x LTM earnings. And that figure still tallies to 24.5x the earnings now projected for the full year 2017 at the start of the Q4 earnings season. So suppose the improbable occurs and they actually make the current estimate of $110.50 per share for Psi 2017, just two weeks ago it was $114.45. In a word, it would be exactly nothing to write home about. That's because this current year estimates compares to $85 per share posted way back in June 2007 at the pre-crisis earnings peak. The 10-year peak-to-peak growth rate, therefore, would amount to a mere 2.5% per year growth rate. That is to say, the revilers and Momo chasers are buying the third oldest business cycle in history, at month number 103, at a nosebleed PE multiple so late in the cycle that the next recession is palpable. And they are doing so after chalking up the lowest earnings growth trend in modern history. During the 2000 to 2007 cycle, for instance, peak to peak earnings growth for the S&P 500 was 8%, and for the 1990 to 2000 cycle it was 9.5%. The above cited PE multiples are based on reported GAAP earnings, of course, because that's the only way to honestly and consistently measure results. The notion that one-time charges for goodwill write-offs, plant and store closures, employee severance, and restructuring charges and the like don't count is simply a Wall Street scam. All of these so-called X-items charges consume corporate cash or waste corporate capital. That's why they are included in GAAP-based filings with the SEC, which CEOs and CFOs must certify as correct upon penalty of jail time. Moreover, Always recall that these street-based X-items hockey sticks also have a way of deflating rapidly near the end. For example, as recently as March 2016, the Wall Street consensus for S&P 500 X-items earnings for Psi 2017 was $136 per share. But after being lowered every quarter since then, it is now down to $125 per share and still dropping. So even if you value the market at earnings less anything inconvenient, it's still trading at a 21.7x PE multiple for 2017. But here's where the delirium part comes in. Even at Wall Street's X-items number for Psi 2017, 
S&P 500 profits have essentially flatlined during the last three years, rising by just 2.9% per annum since September 2014. The Balahood outbreak of growth during the last several quarters, therefore, represents nothing more the commodity inflation and deflation cycle moving through the numbers in pig in the python fashion. This time is apparently different, however, because Wall Street's ex-items hockey sticks are projecting growth of 20% in 2018 and a further 11% in 2019. What they aren't projecting, of course, is the huge headwinds to earnings growth implicit in the aforementioned collision of the Fed's unprecedented QT program and the massive $1.2 trillion borrowing requirement of the Treasury next year. Soon the yield shock will hit the equity markets with full fury. That's because the trillions of leveraged, on repo, private capital, which have been front-running the central bank's bond-buying campaigns, will also pivot, the realization will dawn that picking up nickels from selling what the central banks are selling is a sure way to mint money just as the opposite was true during the run-up of central bank balance sheets from $2 trillion to $22 trillion over the last two decades. Needless to say, the history books are very clear about what happens during a blow-off top that hits at asymptote. To wit, during the first 60 trading says of 2000, the Nasdaq 100 climbed by 27% dash rising from 3,700 to 4,700 on March 27. Alas, 12 trading days later, this entire bubble top gained had been wiped out with the index down by 23% to just 3,600 dash dash and on its way 18 months later to 850. That is, an 85% wipeout. What's different this time, of course, is that there will be no rapid monetary reflation or other bailout from Washington. As we are learning from the latest shutdown contraton, it has now become the big bloated engine that can't. panic that uh, reached a peak in September, October 2008 with Lehman and AIG. So there's separate things they can run together. So let's kind of separate them, talk about the business cycle. I'm not as optimistic on the economy right now. I know there's a lot of hoopla. We just had the big Trump tax bill and the stock market's reaching all-time highs. I mean, I, I read the tape. I, I get all that. But um, there are a lot of uh, headwinds in this economy. There's good evidence that the Fed is over tightening. Remember, the Fed is doing two things at once that they've never done before. They're raising rates. I mean, they've done that many times, but, but they're raising rates. But at the same time, they're reducing their balance sheet. This is the opposite of QE. I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with QE, quantitative easing, which is money printing. That's all it is. And they do it by buying bonds. And when they pay for the bonds from the dealers, they do it with money that comes out of thin air. That's how they expand the money supply. Well, they did that starting in uh, 2008 all the way through till uh, 2013. And then they, they tapered it off, and the taper was over by the end of uh, 2014. But they were still buying bonds. So that was six years of bond buying. They expanded their balance sheet from $800 billion to $4.4 trillion. Well, now they're putting that in reverse. They grabbed the gear, and they shifted it into reverse. And they're actually they're not dumping bonds. They're not, they're not going to sell a single bond. But what happens is when bonds mature, the Treasury just sends you the money. So if you bought a five-year bond five years ago and it matures today, the Treasury just sends you the money. Well, when you send money to the Fed, the money disappears. It doesn't, it's the opposite of money printing. So the Fed's actually destroying money, actually reducing the money supply. So they're raising rates and destroying money at the same time. It's a, it's a double whammy of tightening, and I don't uh, believe the U.S. economy is nearly as strong as the Fed believes. They rely on what's called the Phillips curve, which says unemployment's low. Uh, that's a constraint, and uh, you know wages are going to go up, and inflation's right around the corner. And that's part of the reason they're they're tightening. But there are a lot of flaws in that theory. First of all, the basic Phillips curve theory is junk. It's just not true. We saw that in the late '70s when we had sky high unemployment and sky high inflation at the same time and we've also seen it recently when we've had low unemployment and disinflation at the same time so you can start by saying the Phillips curve is junk but even if you thought there was something to it there's so many problems with it in terms of labor force participation demographics debt deleveraging technology etc that it just doesn't apply under the current circumstances so the Fed's tightening for the wrong reason they're tightening at the wrong time and there's a lot of evidence that a lot of the 
growth in the fourth quarter was uh, consumption driven, but that was debt driven. People charged up their credit cards, consumer debt spiked, a savings rate is uh, near a very long term low. It doesn't look sustainable. So, lots of reasons to think that the Fed's going to overdo it, get it wrong, tighten, throw the economy either into a recession or very low growth with disinflation. So, I'm just not buying the inflation. Happy days are here again story. And there's also good reason to believe that the tax bill will not be as stimulated as people expect. That all that's really going on is the running up a deficit by another trillion dollars, and we're already way into the danger zone, and then that's actually a drag on growth. So good reason to think the economy is going to slow. That by itself would take the wind out of the stock market and cause a, a, a potentially very serious stock market correction, at least 10%, maybe as much as 20%. So we're talking about going down, as I say, five or 6,000 points on the Dow before the end of the year. So that's one scenario. The scenario I talk about in my book really involves a financial panic. Now, the thing there is that these are not that rare. We, well, we, I already mentioned the uh, the one uh, really two day panic in 1987, but 1994 you had the Mexico tequila crisis. Uh, in 1997 you had the Asian financial crisis. In 1998 you had the Russia long term capital management crisis. In 2000 you had the dot com meltdown. 2007 the mortgage meltdown. 2008 the financial panic. Uh, these things happen every, you know, five, six, seven years, not like clockwork, but that's kind of a typical tempo for these kinds of meltdowns. And it's been nine years since the last one. So nobody should be surprised if it happens tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not predicting it will happen tomorrow. I'm just saying nobody should be, be surprised if it does, whether it's tomorrow or next month or next year or even a year and a half from now. Don't think for one minute that we're living in a world free of, of financial panics. And by the way, you, these two things could happen together. You could have a slowdown that leads to a financial crisis, a replay of 2008. But here's the difference, and this is really the, the, the point of your question, Mike. In 1998, we had a financial panic, and Wall Street got together and bailed out the hedge fund long-term capital management. In 2008, we had a financial panic, and the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. So each bailout gets bigger than the one before. In the next panic, whether it's this year or next year, who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, each panic's bigger than the one before. Each response is bigger than the one before, going down this uh, chronological sequence. The next one is going to be the biggest of all. It's going to be bigger than the central banks, and you're only going to have one place to turn. If you had to get global liquidity right now, the Fed said that 1.5% in terms of the target Fed's funds rate so the most they could cut is 1.5% to back to zero. There's good evidence that to get the U.S. economy out of a recession, you have to cut interest rates 3 or 4%. Well, how can you cut them 3% when you're only at one, you know, one and a quarter, one and a half percent? Well, the answer is you can't. So then what do you do? Well, then you go to QE. But they already did that. They haven't unwound the QE. They started to. And that's what I mentioned, but they haven't unwound it. The balance sheet is still around $4 trillion. So what are you going to do, go to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? I mean, some people would say, yeah, well, what's the problem? Those are the modern monetary uh, theorists, you know, uh, uh, Stephanie Kelton, Paul McCulley, Warren Mosler. There, there are a bunch of them who think that there's no limit in the amount of money the Fed can print, but there is a limit. It's not a legal limit. That legally, the Fed could do it. But there's a psychological limit. There's an invisible confidence boundary that you cross, and people just say, you know what, I'm out of here. Get me out of dollars. Get me into gold, silver, fine art, land, it, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, cryptocurrencies, if you like, whatever it might be. But get me into something other than dollars because I've lost confidence in the dollar. We've seen that before also. So putting that all together, in the next financial panic, and nobody should be surprised if it happens tomorrow. It's going to be bigger than the central banks. They're going to have to turn to the IMF for liquidity. Uh, the IMF has a printing press also. That's the International Monetary Fund. They can print this world money called the Special Drawing Right of the SDR. So, yeah, they can pull trillions of SDRs worth, you know, trillions of dollars. One SDR is worth about a dollar fifty. They could pull trillions of SDRs out of thin air and pass them around. But here's the point. I spoke to, to uh, Tim Geithner about this, former Secretary of the Treasury. It takes time. The last time they did this, by the way, it went completely unnoticed. You know, the panic was in 08, and in August, of, August and September of 2009, the IMF did issue SDRs to help with global liquidity. But that was a, almost a year after the panic. And the point is, it just the IMF is kind of slow and clunky. They're not, it's not the fire department. I mean, they might be like a construction crew that can come in and put it into a foundation, but they're not the fire department that can help you when the building's burning down. So what they're going to have to do is what I call ICE-9. 
they're going to have to freeze the system. First, starting with money market funds, then bank accounts, then stock exchanges. Uh, you know, they might reprogram the ATM to let you have you know, $300 a day for gas and groceries. They'll say, well, why do you need more than $300 a day? That You, know, get, you get some food and gas in your car. Why do you need more than that? Uh, we can't let you take all your money out of the bank. We can't let you take your money out of the money market funds. We can't let you sell your stocks. And I describe all this in the book in detail with a lot of end notes. You don't have to read the end notes unless you want to, but this is all documented. It's all publicly available. It's not some science fiction scenario. This plan is actually in place, and I describe how. So just to kind of wrap up, I expect a weaker economy than the mainstream in 2018, perhaps stock market correction based on that alone. I also expect another financial panic. It's a crisis. You make some very interesting comments. Now, while the financial media is talking about booming stock markets and accelerating GDP growth, you aren't quite as op optimistic. Uh, we both know that most of the growth we've seen in recent years has been built with huge amounts of central bank stimulus, and the fundamental problems that drove the last financial crisis have hardly been resolved. In fact, uh, you think the next financial catastrophe isn't too far away, and, and many among the elite are getting ready for it. If you can, briefly lay out uh, some of what you've been seeing. Sure, Mike. You, uh, you touched on two different threads. One is the sort of, let's call it the short to intermediate term, which is, you know, how's the economy doing? Uh, what would the forecast be for the year ahead? What do I think about stocks and so forth? That's one part of the analysis. But the other one is a little bigger and a little deeper, which is what about another major financial crisis, liquidity crisis, global financial panic, and what would the response function be to that? So let me, let me separate. They're related because uh, I mean, what the point, one point I always make is that there's a difference between a business cycle recession and a financial panic. There are two different things. They can go together, but they don't have to. For example, October 19, 1987, the stock market fell 22% in one day. In today's Dow terms, that would be the equivalent of 5,000 Dow points. So we're at, you know, 26,000 or whatever as we speak. 22% drop would take it down about 5,000 points. Now, you and I both know if the Dow Jones fell 500 points, that would be you know, all anybody would hear about or talk about. Well, imagine 5,000 points. Well, that actually happened uh, in, in percentage terms uh, in October 1987. So that's a financial panic. But there was no recession. The economy was fine. Uh, we pulled out of that in a couple of days. It actually, after the panic, it wasn't such a bad time to buy, and, and stocks rallied back. Then, for example, in 1990, you had a recession, a normal you know, business cycle recession. Unemployment went up, there were some defaults and all that, but there was no financial panic. In 2008, you had both. You had a recession that began in 2007 and lasted until 2009, and you had a financial